Welcome to Accessible Art History, the podcast, Season 11. As mentioned in the trailer, this season will focus solely on women artists. Too often, they've been relegated to the sidelines of art and history. So, I want to feature them and teach you about how they overcame adversity to change the world around them. All images and sources will be in the associated blog post linked in the description details. Make sure to follow at accessible.art.history on Instagram for all updates. So, without further ado, let's get started. This week, I'll be discussing the life and works of one of my personal favorite artists, Artemisa Genelaski. Although I've discussed two women artists already, St. Hildegard and Lavinia Fontana, Artemisa is one of the first female artists that we have solid records in history for. This is truly a shame because she lived and worked during the Baroque era of the 17th century, and it should have happened far before this. But I digress. Genelaski is one of the greatest artists of all time, in my humble opinion because she used her art to speak for her gender, regardless of how painful it was to relive her traumas. So to learn more about this incredible woman, keep on listening. One quick note before we get started, I want to give a trigger warning for this episode. I will be discussing stories of sexual assault as it plays a major part in Janileski's biography. If this is something that affects you, I recommend skipping this episode. I have put information for the National Sexual Assault Hotline in the show notes on the blog. Artemisia Loma Gentileschi was born on Rome on July 8, 1593. She was the oldest child and only daughter of Prudenza di Ottavino Montone and Orazio Gentileschi. Her father was a painter from Pisa, but he moved to Rome to pursue his career. He found success in the Eternal City, where he learned from his friend Caravaggio. Sadly, Prudenzia died in 1605. Unusually for this time, Artemisia was allowed to study with her four brothers at their father's studio. It was clear from a young age that she was immensely talented. In fact, records indicate that she was the most skilled of the Gentileschi siblings. Her father taught her many of the Baroque techniques, which I'll talk about later in this episode. However, in 1611, Artemisia's life was turned upside down. She was raped by two men, Augustino Tossi and Cosimo Quirli. When her father found out, he made Tossi promise to marry the young Artemisia to preserve her family's reputation. As you can see, there was no regard given to Artemisia's personal feelings or her trauma. Tossi agreed, and he used this as leverage to continue to assault Artemisia. When it became clear that he had no intention of marrying her, Orazio took him to court. Again, this was to preserve his own reputation, as opposed to protecting his daughter. The details of this trial were recorded and have survived to our time. It was intense, brutal, and Artemisia wasn't treated like a victim. She wasn't necessarily believed and was forced to relive the assault over and over again. In fact, she was tortured with the, quote, moderate use of thumbscrews with the intention of verifying her testimony. Although Tossi was found guilty and banished from Rome, his punishment was never enforced. Six months after the trial, Orazio arranged for Artemisa to marry a minor Florentine painter named Pier Antonio Stalazze. The couple moved to Florence to get away from the painful memories of Rome. Together, they had five children. However, only two survived infancy, and only one of those two survived to adulthood. The move to Florence proved to be an excellent decision. The Medici family became her patrons, and she created her, some of her most famous works during this period. In addition, she was exposed to the great learning opportunities of the city and was taught to read, write, and play music. This speaks to her intelligence, as women weren't given many opportunities in this period of history. In 1616, Artemisia became the first woman to ever be admitted to the prestigious Academia de la Arte del Diseño, or the Academy of the Arts of Drawing. The academy was founded in 1563 by Florentine ruler Cosimo I de Medici on the advice of artist and historian Giorgio Vasari. Other illustrious names included in the roster include Michelangelo, Cellini, and Bronzino. This shows us just how talented Artemisia was. In 1620, she moved back to Rome with her family. This was partially due to the legal and financial troubles, and partially because of her affair with a wealthy nobleman named Francesco Maria Marenghe. However, despite these troubles, Artemisia found equal success in Rome. After 1623, there are no surviving records of her husband, so historians assumed he passed away. She eventually moved to Venice and then Naples. There are records of her going to England for a short time for royal commissions, but they ended with the outbreak of the English Civil War. Artemisia spent the rest of her life in Naples. Records aren't particularly clear on her death date, but it's likely between 1654 and 56. Now that we've heard 
her biography, let's move on to an artistic analysis. But first, let's take a quick break. Hey everyone, I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about what software I use to bring Accessible Art History, the podcast, to life. It's called Anchor, and it's truly made a difference in my mission of making art history fun and easy to learn about. Although I'd always thought about adding a podcast to my content creation, the thought scared me. I'm not an audio engineer or a tech guru, but Anchor makes it so easy. You can use their website or app to record, edit, and spice up your audio with music. They partner with you to make your podcast a success. Not only do they take care of distributing it to all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, But they even match you up with sponsors with no minimum listenership required. It makes creating a podcast easier than I honestly thought possible. But the best part, it's absolutely free to use. As someone who is in the beginning stages of content creation, I'm so thankful to have a free platform that helps me create a quality podcast. If you want to get started on your own podcast, simply go to anchor.fm, that's A-N-C-H-O-R-F-M, or download their app on your preferred app store. Thanks so much for listening. All right, now that we're back, let's dive into her elements of Artemisia Genaleschi's art. The first is her use of tenebrism. This extreme use of the contrast between light and dark was pioneered by Caravaggio. As a student of the Baroque period, Artemisia would have been taught this technique in her father's workshop. Tenebrism was used to heighten drama and draw the viewer's eye to where the artist wanted it. One of her best examples of this is Judith and her maidservant with the head of Holofernes, painted between 1623 and 1625. A single candle illuminates the scene. It focuses our attention on the fear and determination of the two women. They've committed murder to save their people, and now they must hide the evidence. However, the light also shows us that they did the right thing, and that gives us and the women strength. This is compounded by the fact that Judith has a sword, but it's an afterthought. She doesn't need it now. Another way that Gentileschi excelled is her use of naturalism. Again, this is a concept developed by Caravaggio and was popular at the time. Gone were the days of the Renaissance idealism. Now it was all about showing the dark, nitty-gritty elements of life. She wanted to show it as it really was. One of my favorite works to illustrate this is her self-portrait of St. Catherine of Alexandria. Painted between 1615 and 17, art historians are fairly certain that this is her true likeness. It's one of many self-portraits in her catalogue raisonné. In this work, and others like it, we see Artemisia's true self. Yes, she is shown in the guise of a 4th century martyr, which could also be symbolism in and of itself, but Artemisia is shown as herself. Her curly brown hair and flushed cheeks have essentially become her signature. She is beautiful but she's not idealized or perfect. This final artistic element is most commonly cited for Genaleschi's art. It's her frequent showcase of the theme of female revenge and power. This is quite understandable, given her past trauma. In a time where women were treated like second-class citizens, this was the only way she could express herself and her pain. We do see a bit of healing here, as women are always in a place of power in her art. It's an early form of feminism and female power. One of the most often cited examples of this concept is Judas slaying Holofernes. She painted several examples of this biblical story, but this is her earliest version, from 1612 to 13. In this piece, we see Judith, the Old Testament heroine, slaying the general Holofernes to save her people. She has no hesitation or fear. She tightly grips the general's hair and she severs his head as blood gushes forth. But she isn't alone. Her main servant holds the general down so that Judith can complete her mission. This work shows Genaleschi and the world that she held power to change her situation. Yes, she didn't necessarily get the justice that we think she deserved, but she made a name for herself and was revered by history. Not only is Artemis Genaleschi one of the greatest female artists of all time, she is certainly one of the greatest artists of all time. She managed to take her trauma and pain and turn it into something beautiful and inspirational for generations of women to come. This is especially remarkable given the time period where she grew up and the fact that women artists were rare to begin with. Make sure to tune in next week when I travel to the Netherlands to discuss Rachel Rausch.
thank you for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. New episodes will premiere each Monday, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a rate and review. Make sure you follow Accessible Art History on Instagram at accessible.art.history for all updates and daily art of the day posts. See you next time.